I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Be water, my friend. Welcome to another episode uh, of the Flow Great Show. And uh, I'm very excited to have Taro Isokapila with me. I'm not sure if I pronounced it right. The founder of Four Sigma Foods, a super interesting company that I'm very excited also in the future to collaborate with uh, on the several products that we'll dig into in this episode. Uh, welcome to the show, Taro. Thanks for having me, Max. It's great. We just met in uh, Austin at the Paleo FX uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, started talking and, you know, found a lot of, I'd say, like, we, that, that we were very like-minded in a lot of areas. And uh, Tero, I, I did a little bit of research and I know you didn't come uh, to the subject uh, as a foodpreneur, I'd say, uh, from, from nowhere, but you actually grew up on a farm. C could you maybe tell you... Uh, uh, our audience, your backstory a little bit, where you come yeah. from. Yeah, so grew up in Finland, yeah, about two hours north from Helsinki. It's a town called Mahanala, which is just, it's like the opposite of the lake of Nokia. So I guess like that would every German or global citizen know Nokia, the phones. So I uh, grew up there. Um, me and my brother are 13 generation family farmers, so we don't know for sure how long, but at least 13 generations. And my dad is an agronomist and my uh, mom taught physiology and anatomy. So, and then I went to my great granddad helped found this environmental school, which is kind of like Waldorf meets Steiner type of school. Uh, so foraging, building nests for owls, whatever. So that was my background and first degree in chemistry. Then went to an international school and then studied a little bit of nutrition and then uh, now start trying to study business as well you, you, <laughs> to you, understand that. <laughs> uh, okay, you mean as a so sort of your education after your, the, the schooling? Yeah, totally. A... Um, yeah, it's kind of, um, I think Mark Twain said, never let education interfere with your learning. And I, I, I feel that's pretty spot on, but you know, there's a, I've definitely also spent time in, in the school part of it, but I think learning is much more interesting than schooling, so to say. Oh, definitely. And even though in school, you also, I think were quite successful. I read that you won an, an innovation award as a freshman selling already a, a product that you're selling now i think it was um culinary mushrooms to tokyo can you tell me that story real quick yeah it started as a joke i was um so first year of undergrad super bored i was pretty bored at school in general uh me and my friend were just goofing around when we saw this innovation contest from um of this like engineering school that was kind of got government funded. And we just, as a joke, entered it with this concept that we kind of knew that did exist, that there was a, this a rare mushroom also growing in Finland that was only thought to grow in Japan. We just made a business plan out of it during, during the class when we're supposed to study something totally different <clears throat> and won. So that was, that was kind of it, but definitely started as a joke. So. I see. Okay. And one other story that I heard about you is that you eat clay in the morning. Is that still true? And why do you do that? Yeah, um, definitely. So actually I've switched it up a bit and I use it now through my toothpaste. So I swallow my toothpaste that is made out of clay, but originally about, I don't know, when did I find zeolites? I want to say maybe like seven, eight years ago. It was one of the kind of when the superfood started booming I've, and it really helped with my uh, stomach. I was running a lot at that time and that causes acidity, I guess, and st other stuff, but it really helped a lot. So I started taking zeolite and now I'm being taking bentonite clay uh, through my toothpaste. So if you want to read about that, almost all mammals on the planet consume dirt <laughs> at some capacity and have this negative charge, but you know, it's, it's not as much flow related, but if you want to look into it, eating clay is pretty fun. Oh, so. really? Okay. I'm, you know, I talked a lot about bentonite clay with my buddy, uh, Andy Nilo, the mm -hmm. founder of, of the, the clay Alatura mask. He was also on the podcast. 
Cool. And uh, so I put it on my face from time to time, you know, to extract toxins. I know it's good for that, but I didn't know you could adjust it as well. So I'll look into that. Yeah, that and, and you can make your own using maybe like essential oils that are really antibacterial, antiviral, um, clay, um, and then maybe like charcoal that you, you take from Bulletproof is you can have the coconut charcoal and that's a great detox, mouth puring. It'll make your mouth really black, but it's, it's a great one. So you can make your own toothpaste at home if you want. All right, very cool. I actually just from, from Austin, I got this MCT oil paste uh, which yep. kind of looks like clay uh, in a i way. think they do have i think that company has if i'm not incorrect if i don't remember they have clay in that I th- so it might be because the company is even called dirt i think so i think yeah. they kind of that's a great that's a great brand i've i've used their products so yeah no i like them a lot uh they're not over here though i think it's it's always tough for you might be able to dig into that because you have some, some experience into that the different you know uh, attitudes in different con- continents on different continents uh, towards medicine in general. And, yeah, I, uh, I, I, if I can jump in, when I started the company, I was still living in Switzerland, and I was like the biggest customer of iHerb.com at that time. It, at that time, it was like the better place to buy. And if you order small enough parcels, they came through without the customs even looking at it. So there was like a threshold. If you went below, you could order all kinds of stuff. And yeah, I was I don't I was getting packages every other every other day. So yeah, you know it's it's really tough. You know we we actually deal with the bulletproof products over here. And uh, Dave Asprey at one point, just a little side story, he had trouble getting stuff into Switzerland one time, and so I had my mom drive over a whole trunk of full of bulletproof products to the World Economic Forum, <laughs> so Dave could have some products there. Uh, That's so cool. Even within Europe, it's not not so easy. I even as a side story is like I heard this story that like when Hewlett Packard started one of their first European offices back in the day, they would fly in the cash uh, through Switzerland and drive through the border with something like outrageous, like half a million dollar in cash or something like that. I don't know if this is true, but I think a lot of people have done this in Europe over the years is just because the border control is nothing there. So you can just drive through. Obviously, it's it's risky, but people do it. Wow. Yeah. I guess, you know, we could have stopped with, uh, I think 40 kilograms of grass fed butter. <laughs> in the truck. I don't think they would actually, if you you probably had to declare it and there's a threshold, but wow. Yeah. Uh, anyways, you know, it's, it's, it's super interesting because would you consider yourself now, uh, with four Sigma foods, a Finnish company or a U.S. company or an international company? No, that- we, we, I guess we've been pretty international from the get go. You know, we were living, I was living in Switzerland and the other guys were in, in Ireland and Hong Kong and Paris pretty much when we started. And, um, yeah, but we moved uh, like a year and a half ago, two years ago, pretty much two years ago, we moved the business to the U S so we are an American company founded by Finnish people. So um, we have, you know, uh, operations in, in Europe and a subsidiaries in Europe, but um, we were, we're now an American company. So yay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Now we already jumped in. So this episode is obviously, you know, about uh, sub- a subject that you know a lot about, which is medicinal mushrooms and adaptogenic herbs. And uh, I think this is very exciting stuff, but for, for a start, maybe can you explain really quickly, what is the difference between medicinal mushrooms, adaptogenic herbs, and the so-called shrooms? Because sometimes people mix all of them up. And I think we just have to clarify that from the, from the beginning. Yeah, for sure. So fungi are a kingdom, same way as plants and animals, and same way as there's many kinds of animals. um, There's many kinds of plants, there's many kinds of mushrooms. And so Shrooms is a kind of a nickname for halogenic mushrooms. So things that affect your brain in a way that we partly understand and partly don't understand, but we're going to get visuals and there will be new neural pathways formed. Like that's now proven that completely other. So literally you think outside the box. And because of the research and political factors in most countries, they're illegal and, um, that's now actually something the U.S. is kind of, there's an organization called MAPS is working on it to, um, that you might 
be able to get those prescription for PTSD or people with maybe opiate addictions. But so far, that's the legal type of stuff. Then there's medicinal mushrooms, which are basis for about 40% of our pharmaceuticals. So there's about 400-ish mush, uh, mushrooms in the fungi kingdom um, that are legal, and they have been proven. <clears throat> there might be more, but these are what we know of today, like around 400, that have sif- significant amounts of metabolites. So different compounds that behave um, in our body. You can think like, I guess, like in the whole food form, they are whole foods. They're foods that kids can have, elderly people can have, but they affect our bodily functions in some way significantly. Uh, and often they're derived and synthesized into pharmaceuticals so you, pharmaceutical companies can protect their intellectual property. Um, penicillin is is <clears throat> is the one that people know, but there's different kind of immunosuppressions, which is kind of interesting for this field because I think a lot of people who are in the biohacking have some kind of experiences with things like autoimmune disorders or inflammation. You know, that's one of the categories that a lot of the biohacking is is focused on. So there's pretty interesting stuff for, I guess, autoimmune, calming down, uh, suppressing the immune system, which sounds awful. It's depressing, but mm. it's like modulating, I guess, a better word. <laughs> and then, um, so adaptogenic herbs, often said herbs, but some mushrooms fall into that category, is a, is a, a fairly new term. It's a, about 50, 60 years old term, but a lot of these herbs have been used for thousands of years. So adaptogens are... Um, kind of like name indicates, they help your body to adapt to stressors. Now let's talk what they have to be. They have to be non-toxic. Again, kind of like these medicinal mushrooms, they're safe. Mm-hmm. They're safe. And uh, what is hard with them and Western research is that the, by definition, adaptogens needs to be non-specific. So when something is non-specific, it's also hard to modern research to study because it's modern research is very specific. So you can study those adaptogens on singular functions, but the whole concept of them is that they're non-specific and non-toxic. And they're things that essentially are not stimulative like coffee and they're not sedative like let's say valeriana or something like that. So they're safe, but they modulate usually your glands that produce hormones, but also your blood circulation and things like that. Uh, which we can go into detail. Why would you care about that as a as a as a biohacker, or if you want to achieve flow? Mm-hmm. But, but um, so some mushrooms are part of adaptogens. There's you know there's a lot of debate on this. Nobody keeps official list which are adaptogens. I think there's like ten to twenty adaptogens in the world. I think a lot of stuff that is called an adaptogen is just you know good for you, but doesn't affect the body in the same way. Um, like for me, turmeric is not an adaptogen. It is a very powerful anti-inflammatory spice. <laughs> so okay. the, it doesn't mean that turmeric is bad. No, on the contrary, you should definitely have turmeric. It's one of the better study things. But I wouldn't put it in the, in the class of adaptogens per se. I see. Wow. Yeah, I think because of the non-specific nature, which you just described, uh, adaptogens are often put into this esoteric corner where people think okay it does something and uh but are there actually uh would you say that on on most of these um herbs that you also deal with is there scientific uh base bases uh, like a scientific foundation that uh yeah can be used to really like also convince doctors and and people from the medical field to to take them or is it yeah so yeah, so there is. So Four Sigma is actually a geeky way of saying that we only focus on the 50 most research foods in the world. So things that would have that Western research. And funny enough, a lot of them are adaptogens. And by the way, turmeric is one of the most 50 research things. So it's okay. nothing away from that. <clears throat> but uh, a lot of them are adaptogens and a lot of them have historic use. But the, they're studied for something specific like blood circulation, sport performance, so I guess the original, original biohackers were the Soviet army and soldiers. And I guess part of also Germans, you know, studying what can athletes take. Um, sometimes it was legal. Sometimes it was not, not so legal. Yeah, but things that you could take. It was <laughs> yeah. not often very legal. <laughs> yeah, no, 
<laughs> no, no pun intended. But uh, so this was like obviously the two things where there was money for that kind of research at that time was you know the army and the and the sports, and obviously those two were very closely aligned as well. So some of those uh, athletes were also part of the military. So so things that you could give boost performance without the letdown next day. So there was actually a lot of studies from, um, let's say, Rodiola, Shisandra, Yulathero, Ginseng, all this kind of stuff for, for example, running, skiing, grip strength, um, oxygen intake, um, but also cognitive function. So, so there's definitely studies, but then they focus on something very specific. So do, do we see an impact on this specific thing? But the interesting part about adaptogens is that the same thing might affect certain people differently. So if, for example, if you have adrenal fatigue um, and you're really like in a fight or flight situation, certain things might help you calm down and sleep deeper. Whereas for another person who doesn't have that problem, it might be like a steady surge of energy and it just means what you kind of need. And this is very esoteric. And so some people don't like this, but from, a, from an actual scientific point of view, these are some of the world's most studied foods. Um, absolutely. Right. It fits very well, I feel like, uh, into the quantified self scene, you know, where you have these studies with n equals one, where you have to just try out and measure certain parameters. So now, uh, actually, before uh, going any further, just for the people who heard adaptogens now in medicinal mus mushrooms, uh, can you name just a few? Because I think that people have probably heard of ginseng and ashwagandha and, the, and rhodiola, but these count as. Um, adaptogenic herbs, but they're not mushrooms in that case. And then, yeah, uh, can you just list in these two groups a couple so we know what we're? Yeah, so about? Um, a lot of them are roots. So um, they're called ginseng something, even though there's only a couple real ginseng, three. So Nodo ginseng, Panax ginseng, and then the American ginseng. Then Eulothero is called the Siberian ginseng. It's not, it's different family, but it's called, or Rhodiola is called a Nordic ginseng, even though it's in a different family. Suma it would be like um, Brazilian ginseng or Amazonian ginseng sometimes. And, and maca, which is for me a little controversial, but um, it's... Um, and then what else? Can you yeah, go into detail why maca is uh, controversial? Because I just talked with Ben Greenfield when I recorded with him. Uh, and he was also careful with it, but he said it might be a testosterone booster. Uh, yeah. I think it's suffered, it's a lot of hype on it. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Some people do get stomach problems because of how it's processed, but but in more like some of the claims made on it, I don't think it's that backed. Um, and I think it doesn't have that strength. Let's say, talk about ashwakanda, kind of the Indian ginseng, again, not a ginseng. Um, I think um, it's a, like one level down in, in power, but... It's pretty nice. I like the taste actually. So I like using it in different things, but um, yeah, I would be a little bit more careful with that. I'm not sure if it suits everybody, which is kind of a requirement in adaptogens almost. That. And then, so these are roots and then there's berries. Shisandra is obviously the top berry and then goji is another one. Again, kind of like, is goji part of it or not? I don't know. Uh, Amla sometimes is put to that category. Again, not sure if that's it. Um, and then there's certain beans, you know, like, um, like mukuna, then, uh, the mushrooms, I would say the two mushrooms that are clearly adaptogens are reishi and cordyceps. Then there is like, is chaga one? I don't, not sure. You know, then, you know, I, I don't want to start hosting a conference on who are accepted adaptogens, but exactly. the ones that just, are like, yeah, just ones that are clear, like Tulsi, Ashwakanda. Uh, maybe um, rhodiola, eulothero, uh, maybe astragalus. I would be more putting into that category. Um, reishi, cordyceps, things like that. Those are like pretty clear in my book, at least. Right. No, uh, it's it's just you know to throw a couple of names out there so people know that they might have heard the one or the other, and now they can say, yeah. oh, okay, it's actually a medicinal mushroom and an adaptogen. And uh, there's a slight difference, but oftentimes they overlap. So I think we cleared that up quite well. Uh, now, you know, I have uh, your packages here right now. And just to announce, we put in the first order and uh, it's on the way already. And I'm very excited to have them in, the, in our shop for the German-speaking Europe audience for now. And, That's awesome uh, because 
I mean, we've have we've been sold in a lot of places, but not so much in Germany. So, I think there's a there's a lot of people who could use and uh, benefit from these products. I think so too. You know, and that's sort of uh, what I've been successful with is just uh, find products that I really would like to have, <laughs> and when <laughs> when I really like them, then I, I I imagine that there are other people out there who also want them, and so I just offer them to other people. And so far, the response has been great. And that's why also I'm, I'm excited to present you to, to our people, to our audience. And I have three specific ones right here, um, which is Chaga, Cordyceps, and Reishi. And as you just described, uh, you know, uh, they work differently for, for different people. And you're also on the packaging, which are very well done. You keep it sort of very uh like not very specific but for example reishi you would you would write on it loosen up with it uh, cordyceps is get fired up and chaga is a force field in a cup so um can you maybe go into detail a little bit more what these three products now what they would do to you so let's start with something that they all do <clears throat> They all have these uh, water-soluble polysaccharides, especially these beta glucans 1.3, 1.6, that are some of the world's most studied compounds. So when we talk about stuff that actually has scientific backing, this is top, top things. So these are things that um, are in the carbohydrate family, as polysaccharide would indicate. You would think, like, why would I have carbs? But actually, you take, like, less than one carb, uh, gram of uh, carbohydrate, and it doesn't, it doesn't spike your blood sugar. On the contrary, it balances it. But it's something that goes into your colon. It will have a high molecule weight. Um, and so what it does is heals gut biome and has these antiviral, antibacterial properties. So probably the safest and most studied thing for your immune system. And again, we talked about this briefly, but modulation. So instead of being immunostimulant that stimulates your immune system, if you're sick, but it also helps calming down if you have these inflammation type of stuff going on, which is, again, I think that is a pretty common theme with a lot of health problems is inflammation. So um, helping support your immune system. And again, it's a boring, it's, nobody really cares for immune system until they realize how many other things it affects from skin to gut health to other things. So healing gut biome, um, improving your immune system. Uh, it's like a boot camp for your immune system. And so these are similar to all of these. Um, then they all have like kind of special skills. Um, so if we start with Rishi, it's known as a more grounding thing, um, possibly affects our endocrine system, has these antihistaminic properties as well. So people, some people have allergic reactions, but it's a very um, calming and grounding mushroom for most people. So we, and it also helps with liver detox. And so that's why we recommend it in the evening, nighttime, it's not sedative, like again, it's not like kava or valeriana, but it's a, it's a, it's a calming thing. We recommend it in the evening time. Cord mm. And that's why it's blue box, by the way. <laughs> like, right. uh. um, Cordyceps is most known for athletes. It actually, I think it became a big hit in the 93 Stuttgart World Championships when the Chinese runner suddenly beat all the records that the first people to run under 30 minutes, 10K and, and everybody was like, oh, doping for sure. And then they tested them several times and they come out clean. And the, their coach, this legendary running coach, said that, no, it was cordyceps and a ton of training miles. So cordyceps helped them train more, but also helped them. Um, so then it's been tested a lot. Even within our team, a couple, a couple of people have tested maximum VO2 max, so maximum oxygen intake. Mm -hmm. So great for that. Traditionally, it's used for like an aphrodisiac and lower back kind of asthma. So it might be great for people who smoke or had asthma or had adrenal fatigue but it's definitely like a surge of energy because of the oxygen intake. And we're going to, that's obviously highly related to flow as well. So flow, you know, the flow of energy. Um, so that's a fascinating one. And then Chaga is, um, has probably, you know, there's the internet loves to debate this, but probably gram for gram, the highest source of antioxidants in the world, especially when it's like wild and dual extracted. But it does have these very powerful uh, antioxidants such as SOD, superoxidase, dismutase, melanin. These are great for skin, lower inflammation. I think it's the best, one of the best things in the world to travel with. So lower inflammation, protect your body. And has a lot of minerals. Again, some people say that all health issues are essentially mineral deficiencies. I'm not sure if that's true, but um, 
uh, from zinc for the germanium and other things like that. Even vitamin D can be high in these medicinal mushrooms. So I would say it's for like inflammation, skin, that kind of stuff. Um, but the good news is a lot of these taste pretty good when you, they mix in the right way, especially in your, in your butter coffee. Uh, so you don't, it's not like, it's not a big hurdle to start using them. And then you suddenly start noticing these health benefits. So that's also pretty nice. Yeah, a lot of people uh, that I introduce to mushrooms and your mushroom powders now, they ask me, doesn't that like taste like mushrooms? But you've actually done a pretty good job also with, uh, I think, adding uh, licorice root and, and different other flavors uh, to make it more tasty i almost i would compare it to a tea, sort of a tea special tea with with uh, very unique flavors um but yeah we say that it looks like coffee tastes like tea <laughs> kind of yeah but <laughs> that's a good quote <laughs> yeah um how often do you drink them um i'm Pretty much, I'm not a huge like a biohacker, quantified self person because I kind of what you indicated is that like there's so many variables, so it's like it's hard to know if this is happening because of that or this. And there's certain things that I do like to look at, like kind of like heart rate a little bit, but and I do my blood work, but I don't panic over any of that stuff. I feel like kind of intuitively I feel same way as when I was running. First, I was looking at my heart rate all the time. And then more you run, the more you just know. You just know if you're on the, uh, you know, anaerobic threshold. You know, even if sometimes if you run like a marathon and you're like nervous, so your heart rate is too high. But in reality, you know that you can keep this pace. You know that like this is comfortable. And if you go too fast, you know you're going to. So there's like that feel. I try to practice that um, more. And um, so I'm not a huge on, on that specifically. But I'm always on a, like an experimental diet. So my use of these mushrooms and products vary a lot. But I would say multiple times a day. And definitely, okay. started, this, definitely started this day as well with that. And, but it varies a lot. Um, but I guess the ones that I keep coming back to is like chaga and reishi. But, um, and then lion's mane, which is great for the brain. That's what I'm about to ask. I, there are two more, lion's mane and turkey tail that are thrown up around quite a bit. Um, yeah, I think the lion's mane is for your audience the most fascinating because of the the you know the nerve growth factor element of it and uh, all the ability the some of the compounds ability to penetrate the blood brain barrier. So I think that's probably a more interesting one. I originally fell in love with cordyceps, um, and that's kind of like the one that you mostly notice easiest. But um, the ones that I'm on pretty consistent on a chagarishi and lion's mane and then i take all kinds of random things that you've not even heard of i just found a mushroom that i don't even think has a correct latin name <laughs> <laughs> that i'm taking so how did you uh, come that across that one um hiking in uh, the mountains of southern california and about 2600 meters high up um on top of a kind of joshua tree um or palm springs found it it's like a national park found this it's in the felinus family i'm pretty sure but uh i'm not quite sure what's the exact latin name and i've been trying to look for it and i can't find it but it looks like it's one of the felinus meshima is in that family as well meshima is one of the things that where harvard medical school has shown that it potentially could help with it has anti-tumor benefits so that's a fascinating mushroom as well but kind of less known all right so for someone who would try them out for the first time like how long or how often would they have to take it to have lasting effects like throughout several days or is it something that you can take right away notice it and then take it at some later point again and notice it again or would you say you have an increasing uh, rate of improvements and benefits yes and yes so it, these are actually some of the, from all these herbal things from whole food sources versus something like synthetic, like the GABAs and other things of the world that are not, definitely not safe on a regular basis. These are, these are safe, but they usually also give a noticeable effect, which is super rare. So especially if you battle with stress or inflammation or anything like that, you usually notice it within the first day, two, three days. If, if you're super healthy, otherwise it might take a few weeks before you start noticing it. 
But in both cases, there will be benefit of constant use. And especially some things you must understand that like body uh, regenerates certain cells and certain parts of our body a bit slower and certain things a bit faster. So how, how quickly skin will heal, you know, a month, 35 days gets thrown out a lot. I think it depends on age and person. Whereas spine, you know, might take a year, you know, two years. So there are certain things, you know, some things they say seven, like eyes and heart and, and, you know, I don't know which source to really trust on this, but I think we know that certain cells regenerate themselves faster than others. Even I've noticed wounds on my body. Like if I get a, um, a cut somewhere in certain parts, it heals faster than other parts in my body. So, you know, that's also dependable on, <clears throat> for example, gut health. It takes a while to rebuild your gut biome. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. Whereas like if you have adrenal fatigue and you use one of these, these herbs and adaptogens, you might like notice immediately helping out. Or, uh, or if you have this brain fog, you might, you know, something might, lion's mane might feel, you, you might feel it immediately. So. Okay. You actually also I just remembered a question that I was asked after I wrote an article <laughs> about uh, medicinal mushrooms and, and also your company and uh, a couple of people asked if it would kick you out of ketosis but you already mentioned that it would keep the blood sugar stable so uh, yeah it would not kick you out of ketosis no way i mean you would have to take something like a whole box of our products to okay. kick you out of ketosis um by the yeah, way have you so, ever heard of any case uh, of overdosing of any of, of those mushrooms yeah no not really <clears throat> there's a super rare group of people that might be allergic to a couple of these mushrooms but it, we're talking like a super super small part of our population and you will notice it immediately and it's not a dosage question i think you're going to plateau pretty quickly let's say three four five grams a day you know that's like two three four five packets somewhere there and then you're probably going to plateau on the effects so your pee will just be more expensive <laughs> but uh, uh, no, there's not, they're <clears throat> generally recorded as safe. Now there's a couple exceptions. Like obviously if you're on any pharmaceuticals, you should talk to your doctor. It's just a general good rule. If you're, if you're uh, pregnant, even though a lot of pregnant people take medicinal mushrooms, it's another thing where you should be a bit more careful. If you're on statins or anti anticoagulants, uh, you know, plot thinners or antibiotics, you know, those often have some kind of also an antiviral, antibacterial properties, and some of them are even derived from uh, fungi kingdom. So those are just things where you should be careful, but it doesn't differ from most, you know, supplements or others. Those are areas when you should anyway be careful on kind of what you're taking. So because it just uh, got into a couple of groups that should be careful, other other like naturally occurring target groups, such as, for example, pregnant women that uh, respond more to a certain product than others any stories you have there I, I i would i would just say cordyceps is because it's so noticeable if you're not used to it take smaller dosages or not at all and reishi is is, is probably like the safest i would say for most people i would say chaga as well but reishi is like if you want to look from if if you have to but again these are foods predominantly and um and they're they're safe but um, I would maybe the cordyceps is the one that I would like. If you're a if if you're a pregnant woman, I would I would that would not be the time when I first try it. If you've okay. already used it and you're familiar with it, so you know kind of your dosing, because it is such a noticeable uplift. Um, so that's why that's why I would think about that. I really I'm a big fan of of reishi before going to bed nowadays. I, I take it pretty much every day. Now and uh, you know, in combination with my blue light filtering glasses, I feel like I have such a much easier time coming down and uh, and falling asleep. And uh, I really notice it. And I'm also trying to track that sort of uh, with my sleep cycle app. And I wanted to know you. Do you know of any? I know you're not uh, big into quantified self, but are there any parameters with any of these products that people can track? Because we have a couple of quantified self people in there, and they would uh, notice like a big change. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm <clears throat> I'm not cr critiquing the movement at all. It's more like for me personally. Exactly. I just, no, I got yeah. so, um, and we definitely do have a bunch of biohack 
markers and quantified sell people using our products. And, and we started about four years ago, 2012. So over those years, we've definitely had a fair share of people who are into testing from blood work to oxygen intake to sleep um, that people do. I think that the one that is most accessible to everybody is really like heart rate variability or using these sleep apps that are now so commonly available, just purely out of the fact that, it, well, sleep and heart rate are so vital to everything, but also they're the easiest probably to measure for most people. Um, there are other things, you know, you can, you know, if, if you want to put the money in, you can uh, measure telomerase and you can do all kinds of stuff, antioxidant testing as well, which is somewhat controversial, but there's a lot of stuff you can do. But I would say, as it comes to flow, stress is such a big thing anyway, because if you want to be productive and you want to have that focus and energy, like the stress management and, and, and a lot of these adaptogens and, and even tonic herbs as a wider category are things that affect blood circulation and somewhat your stress response. So that might be an interesting, just the sleep and the heart rate variability things to measure. And otherwise, I would just say, kind of trust your gut feel, so to say. Before we jump more into flow, uh, just as a side note, because I just recorded with Jamie Wheel from the Flow Genome Project, and uh, they have sort of discovered that the optimal stress is uh, when you have an activity that is 4% more difficult than your actual skill level. So when you, that's a 4% rule. So if you are... Uh, if you like encounter that and subjectively think that this is a little more uh, difficult than your actual skill level, this is the optimal condition to trigger flow. And uh, now jumping into that, because we are the Flow Great Show, and you know, flow, we are uh, a brand this, which uh, has the goal of flow grading people more than upgrading people. So helping them enjoy more flow time, where you know, ego vanishes, time dilates. And uh, I think these products really help, especially we already mentioned a couple of things. But um, for you personally now, what is your biggest flow trigger? What is something that really gets you into the zone? Um, I would say it's a, it's a little esoteric, but it's like curiosity. Like there needs to be this childlike curiosity um, of something. And it's, it's hard to reproduce synthetically it is very organic now you can obviously put your in, yourself in a position where you're more likely to be curious by meeting cool people uh inspiring yourself with nature with food well, definitely with food you can do stuff but it's still something a little bit like you can't guarantee it um, it's something if you force it it's not going to happen so it's like um it's like um Yep. It's, it's like a, it's like a, it's almost like a fart. If you have to force it, it's going to be shit, <laughs> you know? So, um, so kind of like, that's, that's my like curiosity is just like the, my best answer. Yeah. And like, you know, this is a great answer because the, well, according also to the flow genome guys, there are four flow types. They're the heart chargers, you know, the, the adventurists, the, the extreme athletes, base jumpers and so on. And, and then there are the, the crowd pleasers, the, the burning man, crowd and the party goers and then there are the yogis they're called the flow goers that do yoga every day and the sort of vegan type uh, style of living and the deep thinkers and that's where i discover you in because that's where curiosity comes in and these are usually system system engineers you know they like taking things apart they're really curious and look at the different parts and how they work together and then they get really lost in the moment and that's where flow happens so uh, that's uh, often hurt so i think that's that's cool <laughs> so no so, worries at all i'll but... put that on my cv you know <laughs> so i'm deep thinker you know so, i you don't know, have a cv by the way but if i would have one i would probably put it there so oh i don't have one either i'm very proud of that somehow uh so now get going back to these products and flow you know flow uh is also a biochemical process where there are different neurotransmitters released. There's dopamine, anandamide, there's norepinephrine uh, and serotonin. And uh, an important process in flow is when you have sort of the, when you're well facing a difficult task and you have this fight or flight response and your 
epinephrine, norepinephrine goes up, adrenaline, uh, you have to sort of flush it out in order to get into that flow moment. And also your, your brain waves are then changing from a faster beta wave to an alpha wave, almost pushed to theta. And uh, how could you maybe uh, describe how these products could help this process? Yeah, um, this is a very fascinating thing because I think this is the really the next level stuff. Um, at first, as as we both know, it's still a fairly new concept. There is a you ha it's like a puzzle of research. You have to combine research from other areas and maybe like try to form a picture because there is nobody has been like just focus on that. <clears throat> so, but what what is interesting? I'll give like three things that I think are fascinating for this that might be related. One you mentioned is all those neurotransmitters and hormones that um, get produced in our glands is exactly on point with the kind of thinking of what adaptogens do. You know, in layman terms, they balance hormones and help healthier hormonal function. Very, again, broad stroke, but um, very fascinating for that. Um, so that's one category, and we can go deeper into that later. Second one is this stress response that you mentioned, which is also related to that, but it's still like there's other factors to it. Um, we mentioned minerals, um, but we also mentioned um, inflammation and other things like that. So, um, so if 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 your body's capacity or you know um, you know homeostatic capacity or hormetic capacity depends how you want to look at it, but uh, your capacity if you if you're um, what does Americans have this toy? I don't know if you have this. Uh, uh, is, it a, is it a called a teeter totter? It's like oh, yeah. A, yeah, it's like a character that is heavy on the bottom. Right. You flip it and it comes back up. The bounce clown. So I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah, it's like your bounce back ability or something like that. Right. So like, uh, so like, what's your capacity to recover from these like stressors? Like to get back in the center and then like be ready again. You know, so that's one thing. And then third is just um, general health aspect. <clears throat> so like I believe a lot as, a, as, a, as a, in the abstract to the kind of the hierarchy of needs. So like if you want to achieve this flow state, which is this optimal like epitome state of consciousness. Of, yeah, like you, your greatest state of being, these like um, prior needs have been had to met. Like you cannot have it if your outside circle is like there's, you don't feel secure and comfortable and whatever. And uh, a lot of these uh, mushrooms and adaptogens, what they do is build the fundamentals, get ready for you for that moment. So you're, you're healthy and generally just well-being. So and those are three things that I would be most fascinating. So in layman terms, I would say hormonal balance, inflammation and, and general health, um, which are kind of elements, but again, I have maybe there is, but I haven't seen like 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 real real hardcore flow research on just specifically. And maybe you're on top of all that stuff. It's more like collection of oh, we learn about this neurotransmitter and this hormone and this brain function and this stuff, and then you build a picture and stuff that could work, and then you test it on yourself and, and with your friends, and you find systems and models that work for probably are working and then you feel comfortable with that so no totally we're very at the beginning i think of that research still and you know i follow it but i'm also not uh, you know a scientist that is very deep into the field and there have been theories thrown out there i mean for a while it was beet juice which is rich in uh, nitric oxide and mm -hmm. uh, helps flush out stress hormones but now this is being questioned again i asked stephen kotler about that and uh you know there was the the Lon london olympics were called the, the Olympics of Purple Poo because everyone was taking beet juice because it wasn't on the doping list and they yep. thought it would help them get into that flow moment. Uh, so from a nutritional standpoint, I think you described it very well. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you can do and a lot uh, influences this, you know, also I think this very vague concept of flow because flow is also, it's not like you're in flow and you're not because uh, it's, it's, it's a spectrum. And you can tell a child, don't step, you know, on, on the tiles, just, you know, or step on the, the full tiles and not in the lines, and they will walk for 10 meters and they'll flow. And another yeah. person needs um, a lot longer or different triggers and uh, other people get addicted to it. And then they need more and more 
risk in order to get into it like the extreme athlete so uh, but for the general person sitting there i think these products can help very well with just you know like you said balancing out hormones um getting inflammation down and getting them into the state where their body works so well that when there is a trigger they can dive in and i think uh yeah, I mean, I, I think another kind of partly esoteric, but something that everybody can relate to is love. Um, you know, it's like you can't force it. Like it happens when it happens, you know, it comes. But certain fundamentals have to be there. So it's like, you know, it's hard to love another person if you're not comfortable with yourself and other things like that. So I think that's a, that that's, you're not, like I think most people can like innately relate to, are you ready for a relationship? Um at some level and uh it's again it's something like you have to build the baseline before that can happen it can like it's almost like farming as well you build the soil and you get everything ready and you can plant the seeds the seeds might not grow but what you can do is just kind of set it up and then once you set it up it's more likely that good stuff will 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 happen so very true in germany we actually have a saying which is i think very german it's when preparation meets opportunity that's when success happens that is the that's so, system thinking, you know, it's like, it's biohacking for sure. You know, you, you look at the system. So exactly. Speaking of which of biohacking now, uh, because you know, you're in the field and I'd be really interested in finding out a little more about your lifestyle and how, uh, you work. So we already found out you eat clay in the morning, but what are some <laughs> other like things that specifically you do? on an everyday basis that help you get through the day? Um, again, a lot of experimental stuff. And there's certain things that I've been using for a long time that really work for me. But I would say in general, it's hydration is one thing. Um, I think for me, what works for me, and this might be different for others, is, is not eating much. Uh, I don't want to call it fasting because sometimes I nibble, but like not eating much. And then when I eat, I eat a lot. That works for me uh, very strategically in certain times, just like almost overeating that kind of kicks out some hormones. I don't know what happens, but it works for me. Um, but then there's definitely more like today. Uh, right now, recently, I've been going to cryotherapy, big on infrared. That's been going on for a long time. I'm a huge believer in infrared, sauna, hot, cold in general. Um, I sleep on a nail mat pretty much every day. I nap. What That's is a nail mat? Like a like a bulletproof kind of <laughs> what Dave Asprey has no, to sleep No, 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 not <laughs> actual nails. No, no, like plastic lotus uh, flowers. No offense, Dave, but like real nail man. But I guess the same wow. same concept, um, like certain acupressure. Like the nervous system to me is a, is a bigger challenge both for an athlete and uh, if you're an entrepreneur or you want a, a knowledge worker or whatever. It's like muscles recover a lot faster. You can recover muscular things and other things like that lactate a lot faster. And a lot of the nervous system related stuff and like that, like that tension and you can release it, like you can flush it with the flow state and there's other things you can do meditation, but like that's the harder thing. So for me, the nail mat is my thing. And I listen to certain audio tapes <laughs> while I nap on a nail mat. What kind of audio uh, tapes? I probably like 10, 12 years been using Holosync every now and then. I don't know if you know that, yeah. but uh, audio technology. So I'm, I'm not an advocate of them specifically. This just happens, something I've been using, um, but I do believe in the concept of it. It seems to work for me, but I'm not that deep on it. I haven't, like some people follow in that system, they go into different levels and I've just kept doing the basic stuff. I think in general, usually the basic stuff is, is cool. Um, Speaking of Holosync, because uh, the, our listeners missed that, but before you were describing a trip that you've done, um, you called it sound uh, bedding. No, <laughs> sound sound bath. Sound it's bath. Uh, yeah. So it's a it's a it's where science meets magic. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I love it. Or woo, woo, but uh, essentially, there's this place in Southern California called Intecatron. It's built, apparently the UFOs told this guy how to build it. Howard Hughes funded it, if you know the gazillionaire back in the day, very right. uh, quite a character. 
And they build this building that has no metal in it. So it's all wood and glass. It's like, it took a long time to build. It's on the sacred ground with the sacred underground rivers and energy lines, all that. Ooh. But then they play like certain, and it's actually somewhat similar to Holosync is like, and what you mentioned, brain waves. Like we clearly do have different brain waves and we've been able to measure this. And we know that we function as a human being very differently in different brain waves. And that's what we know that certain people who meditate a long time can achieve these, they can alter their brain waves, right? And then we also know that certain music, classical music, this is a long time coming, like you should play your kid classical music and other things. So, but we know, we don't know exactly, like people argue what works, but we know that these have an impact on us, same way as the sounds of ocean or the rain and other things like that, that are so deeply innate in our, probably an evolutionary DNA. So there's these sound baths in very acoustic places that can, there's little vibrations because of like what they do. And again, some of this you can explain by science, uh, some of it's pretty woo out there. But what I know is when I go there, uh, I feel good. So <laughs> and that's, that's, and if that's, if that's placebo, I'll take it, you know? Wow, hey, this is, this is super, it's you know what I have standing here. This is a bottle of water and Matthias will be so happy. It's a friend of mine. He founded this Waterworks company and they make a water which is uh, pH optimized and nutrient optimized. And he's also very big into that stuff. You know, when you freeze water and you play certain music that the crystals yeah. change. So yeah. you have very symmetrical crystals. And you can test that. That you can actually test. So if you, if you have fresh spring water and you put it in ice cube tray and you put it in ice versus just flat water and you look at how... how because we know the water molecule is like a Mickey Mouse with the oxygen and the and they have it forms these um, eight angles oxi oxi uh, oct octagon. uh, octagon octagons and then how it forms like the they the shapes look different so you can actually home test that do you what do you believe is the effect to your body that's a different story but there is there is clearly a difference how it looks so. Um, that's very fascinating. I think. It is very fascinating. And uh, I'm recording actually with him as well. And uh, this is going to be interesting. And uh, wow, I, I love that you're into this uh, stuff because I think that that's what our field makes it or makes it so interesting to me is that there's so many things unexplored and that we can still do and test and try out. And uh, at the end, it's still valid because it's, it's an experiment with N equals one. If it works for you, it works for you. And nobody can argue against that. Yeah. And also, by the way, I got to run. So I'm going to a chiropractor. And, <laughs> Sorry. So, oh, I see that. so that's okay. I yeah. was in flow for a moment here. Um, yeah, that's okay. That's that's totally fine. But uh, maybe one by last... Way, chiropractors and, and spine health mobility as well. It's a very fascinating thing just for energy and how the nervous system is related. And just mobility as well. As, and then spine is kind of like where everything happens. So no, anyway... Totally. Super interesting. Tara, I could have talked for an, uh, hours. Uh, maybe one last question to wrap it up because you have to run. Sure. But one is, uh, I ask that every, every guest, what is the one thing you would like if our listeners could only remember one lesson from you, one thing you told them, what should they remember? Yeah, well, normally, <laughs> normally my answer is, of course, mushrooms, giving mushrooms a chance. But I'm going to give a totally different thing that I've been really seen, recently stoked about, which is something I was excited as a kid, but now I've been, it's wind on my face. So essentially when I am in LA, in Santa Monica, I have to drive certain places. I'm constantly like I open the window, I'm just like putting my head against the wind. And I don't know what's, what's that, but like get yourself in places where you feel the wind on your face. Super random, but it's been something I've been stoked in the last few days again if it's skiing if it's skydiving if it's riding a motorcycle whatever wind on your face i feel like i'm almost smiling when that happens so that's the amazing thing. answer tero thank you so much for being here i loved it and uh hope to have you back at some point and now have fun at the chiropractor <laughs> thanks max goodbye